Welcome back. This is video lecture 18.1, part two. And I'm going to now start talking about the material in chapter 18. Temperature, heat, and the first law of thermodynamics. And so we're going to talk here about basically temperature. Okay, that's the key point. So now let me get to the slide I want to talk about first. Okay, if you want additional reading for this material, you can go to your Wiley Plus book, chapter 18. Section 1 is about temperature and how to measure it. And section 2 is about two particular temperature scales, the so-called Celsius temperature scale and um, the Fahrenheit temperature scale. Section one is about the most important temperature scale um, in science, which is the one I'm going to talk about now. <clears throat> okay, so if we're going to talk about the concept of temperature. That, of course, immediately begs a rather interesting question. What do we mean by temperature? A little bit of a subtle concept, it turns out. We certainly have an intuitive understanding of temperature. You might say a measure of hotness or coldness, even though those are vague terms, but you would know basically what we mean, right? Don't touch that, that's hot. Or that ice cream is really cold. Everybody has a sense of that and a sense of temperature, and that, and that intuitive sense won't misserve you. But it is just intuitive. We'll learn a little bit more about temperature as being related to the random jiggling motion of the atoms inside a material. We'll learn more about that in chapter 19. But for now, why don't we just say temperature is that thing that's measured by a device called a thermometer. And if you want to know how to make a thermometer, read chapter 18, section 1. And you might be surprised, perhaps intrigued, by how subtle and somewhat complicated making a thermometer is, i.e. measuring a property called temperature. The field itself is called thermometry, and it's, it's quite involved. We'll just take it for granted that we can have a device, handheld device, for example, that can measure this property called temperature of a material. If we are going to measure this property called temperature, we need a unit. That's what temperature scale means. It means what unit are you going to use for measuring your temperature. So the key thing to note about the temperature scales that are out there is the most important one. It's the SI unit of temperature. It's called the Kelvin temperature scale. Or to say it another way, Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature. Right? Any measurable thing has some unit in the SI system for temperature it's the Kelvin. So I just want to talk a little bit about the Kelvin temperature scale, and I want to treat it as a directed number line, like a, 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 an axis that has a fixed lower end, but no upper end. Okay, This property called temperature in nature has a lower limit below which we are quite certain nothing can go, and no upper limit. There's no maximum temperature uh, conceivable. Could, you can end up making temperatures in laboratory conditions that are much higher than the temperature of the sun. All right, so no upper limit, but there is a fixed lower limit. And this, is, this is the universe we live in. Okay, okay. So I'm going to represent the Kelvin temperature scale as a, a, a number line increasing to the right as we look at it here. And you can see there, it's, it's got an arrow pointing to the right, and it's got a symbol capital T, that's the symbol for temperature, italic, and then the unit is in parentheses, capital K for Kelvin. This is the temperature, this is a temperature scale in Kelvin. Okay, the Kelvin temperature scale is a so-called absolute temperature scale. An absolute temperature scale is any temperature scale which assigns to the lower limit temperature set by nature, a value of zero. 
hence the name absolute zero, which I'm sure you've heard before. On the Kelvin temperature scale, the lower limit set by nature is assigned the value zero. Okay. Absolute zero on the Kelvin scale is zero Kelvin. So that's my left end of this directed axis, directed number line. And then the right end is increasing temperature. I've marked it off in units of 100. 100 Kelvin, 200 Kelvin, 300 Kelvin, 400 Kelvin, and so forth. And I put a few special tick marks for useful values to know. First thing to know, you may, you probably are aware of the temperature scales that you are used to in your daily life, for example, the Celsius, or if you're in the United States, the Fahrenheit. Those are units are listed with a degree symbol, degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit, and that's how they are indeed listed. But by convention, the unit on the Kelvin scale is just called Kelvin. So don't call it degree Kelvin, and don't write the unit like this. Okay? It's not degree Kelvin. It's just Kelvin. Okay? That's the SI unit of temperature, the Kelvin. Okay. So what are some interesting temperatures on the Kelvin scale to be aware of? Well, down near the lower limit, very close to absolute zero, at 2.725 Kelvin, it's a very important temperature in the field of astrophysics. It's the effective temperature of, of the cosmic microwave background, the remnants of the Big Bang, which were first measured, detected in the 1960s. So that's the effective temperature of the leftover electromagnetic radiation from the Big Bang. Just a little under 3 Kelvin. If you like, that's the temperature out in space. Let's go up from there. Get close to 100 Kelvin at 77 on the Kelvin scale. Nitrogen in the liquid form, if you're below 77, 77 will do what, undergo what's called boiling, which is a phase change we'll study, and goes from liquid to gas. 77 Kelvin is way below room temperature. So when you're at room temperature, you're used to nitrogen being in the gaseous phase, right? <laughs> the air is full of nitrogen gas. But if you get it cold enough, namely 77 Kelvin at atmospheric pressure, you will have a phase change between gas and liquid. So if you have a cup of liquefied nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, sitting in a room, it will be at 77 Kelvin and will be boiling until all the liquid is gas. That's an important temperature. We'll be using liquid nitrogen in our first experiment in 111 lab. Going on up from there, 273.15. By definition, that's the freezing point of water. That's pretty important just on a applications perspective. 273.15 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. Let's go up from there. As you go up from 273.15 and get closer to 300, you get, a, you get a range near 300 Kelvin, which most people will call room temperature. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of physicists will say, uh, let's take 300 Kelvin for room temperature. Now that's a rather, it turns out, a rather warm room in the 80s in the degree Fahrenheit scale, but it's still a handy, nice round number. 300 Kelvin, room temperature for a warm room. Going up from there, 373.15, the boiling point of water, the temperature at which it will change from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so 373.15 is the boiling point. And those are a few temperatures, okay? Just to give you a sense of the Kelvin scale. Here's something that's very important, and you may have already deduced it from what I've told you. Let's look at the temperature range between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water on the Kelvin scale. If I have a sample of water and I want to take it from the freezing point to the boiling point, how far of a temperature change on the Kelvin scale do I have to have? 
Well, I have to go from 273.15 to 373.15. That's a change of 100 Kelvin. Now, if you grew up with, or at least even familiar with, the Celsius temperature scale, you probably know the freezing point of water is assigned the value 0 degrees Celsius. And the boiling point of water is assigned the value 100 degrees Celsius. So what's the range on the Celsius scale between the freezing point and the boiling point of water? The range. The delta T. Delta capital T. It's the same. 100 but now you would say Celsius degrees. Ah, yeah, Celsius degrees, because it's a change in temperature. So here's a very important point. The Kelvin and the Celsius temperature scales have units of equal size. A temperature change, emphasis, of one Kelvin corresponds to a temperature change, again, emphasis, of one Celsius degree. Note the unit, how I'm expressing temperature change on the Celsius scale, Celsius degree. So if I'm talking about changes in temperature, delta capital T, any temperature change on the Kelvin scale between two points is the same temperature change, same two points, on the Celsius scale. Delta T sub K for the temperature change on Kelvin is equal to delta T sub C for the temperature change in degrees Celsius or Celsius degrees. So that's really important to know. The size of the unit on those two scales is equal. And so you can measure temperature changes on those scales interchangeably. If you want to talk about a temperature change, you can do it either in Kelvin or degrees Celsius, doesn't matter. They're equivalent. But you still need to also be able to just plain old convert from a temperature in, say, degrees Celsius to temperature in Kelvin. And here's the conversion. It's additive. It's quite different from any other unit's conversion we've done. All those other units' conversions are multiplicative. You multiply by a conversion factor. Not this one. It's additive. The conversion between temperature in Kelvin and temperature in degrees Celsius is additive, not multiplicative. And there's the formula. To get the temperature of a point in Kelvin, you take the temperature in Celsius and add to that 273.15. Of course, you can turn that around. The temperature in Celsius is the temperature in Kelvin minus 273.15. You've got to be able to go either way. <clears throat> and that's how you convert between Celsius and Kelvin. But either way, use the appropriate one. Okay. So for example, what is the temperature of absolute zero on the Celsius scale? Right? It's not zero. It's zero on the Kelvin scale, but what is it on the Celsius scale? Well, use this lower formula which is really just a rearrangement of the formula above it, put in zero for T Kelvin, and you get that absolute zero on the Celsius scale is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's another important thing. How do you convert temperature between Celsius and Kelvin? That's the formula, and to note that it's an additive conversion, not a multiplicative. That turns out to be important. Okay, now, with that concept of the temperature scale, the SI temperature scale in mind, uh, we are now ready to learn about some laws of thermodynamics. We had laws of motion last semester, Newton's three laws of motion. There are laws of thermodynamics. These are really ideas that were originally hypotheses that have then been tested and tested and tested for hundreds of years by literally thousands upon thousands of experiments. So we will take them as known facts. And it turns out there are four laws of thermodynamics. In this class, we're going to learn about two of them. They're named in a way that might seem odd. They are named the zeroth law, the first law, the second law, and the third law. The zeroth law is named the way it is because it wasn't 
discovered until later, and but it was discovered to be more fundamental, foundational. So instead of making it the n plus first, they made it the zeroth one. We're going to talk about the zeroth law. We're not going to make it overly deep. We don't want to. Okay, It's just setting the stage for what we're going to do from now on. And what we're really going to end up focusing on starting in the next few lectures is what's called the first law of thermodynamics. But for now, we're going to talk about what's called the zeroth law. I do just have to introduce some terminology. Okay, So let me do that now. We've learned about forms of energy last semester. Forms, kinetic energy, energy due to motion, potential energy, the energy due to two objects interacting by means of a special force called a conservative force. Right? There are other forms of energy that we have to keep track of. So now let me introduce you to one. It's actually, it actually peeped into view last semester briefly in Chapter 8. It's called internal energy. Keyword there is internal. It has to do with what's going on inside something, right? Internal. Here's my description of internal energy. It is the total energy of a system measured in a reference frame where the center of mass is at rest. So let's look at that little picture I've drawn. Simply a block sitting at rest on a table. We certainly studied things like that, blocks, on surfaces a lot last semester. But now I'm going to have that block just sitting there. There's the dot there in its middle. That's its center of mass. It's at rest. The whole block is at rest. It's just sitting there on the surface, right, in the reference frame of the ground. And we're observing it. So this is a reference frame where the center of mass is at rest. We might have been inclined last semester to say the energy of that thing is zero. But first of all, we should say we would have called it mechanical energy. And we would have said mechanical energy is simply kinetic plus potential. No kinetic energy because nothing's moving. And no potential energy because we'll put it on, on y equals zero and there's no spring here. Okay. Well, we're not talking exactly about what you would call mechanical energy. The internal energy is the total energy of the system when its center of mass is at rest and it's looking at what's going on inside. And we have to get back now to the atomic hypothesis of matter, which I'll take to be the atomic fact of matter, that there are atoms down in there at the microscopic level, arranged in some manner. And it turns out those atoms are jiggling back and forth in this block. And they're interacting with their neighbors. And they have nuclei surrounded by electrons. And the electrons are interacting with the nuclei in ways we'll learn about later in the semester. And inside the nucleus, there are what are called neutrons and protons, and they interact with each other. So there are all kinds of interactions going on. And the atoms are jiggling. There's energy of that jiggling. It's kinetic. There's potential energy for those interactions. So that's in there. There's what's called rest energy. Einstein e equals mc squared because the electron and the proton and the neutron have mass. There's all kinds of energy in there if you look inside. And it's the total of all that energy from the stuff going on inside that we mean internal energy. Nothing we did last semester affected that unless we talked about what we called thermal energy. Do you remember when that showed up last semester? When rough surfaces slid against each other and we had friction. All right, so now let's talk about thermal energy. It's that part of the internal energy related to the temperature of the body. When rough surfaces slide against each other, they get warmer. Okay? And it's due to the motion of its atoms and molecules. Some people might say the random motion of its atoms and molecules, the jiggling back and forth. Okay? So thermal energy is that part of the internal energy related to the temperature of the body and due to the random motion of the atoms and molecules. That's really what's going to probably be the most important part of internal energy. Let me give you a heads up, a warning. This quantity we've just described, thermal energy as a form of energy, is not, I have to say again, not what is called heat energy, which is certainly a word you've heard before, and I mentioned at the beginning of the previous video. 
Let me just give you a heads up right now. You can't use the words thermal and heat synonymously. We will learn later what heat energy is defined to be. I'm telling you what thermal energy is. It's that part of the internal energy related to the temperature of the body and due to the motion of its atoms and molecules. The jiggly. Okay, now, next idea. Thermal equilibrium. When two objects are given the opportunity to exchange thermal energy, the easiest way to do that is to put them in direct contact with each other, assuming there's no what's called thermal insulation between them. When two objects are given the opportunity to exchange thermal energy, but do not exchange thermal energy, we say the two objects are in thermal equilibrium. That's that's the definition of thermal equilibrium. You give two objects the opportunity to exchange thermal energy. If they do not do so, then we, by definition, say that they are in thermal equilibrium. The assumption, by the way, is that if you take two objects that initially perhaps are not in thermal equilibrium, but put them in close contact, then they will exchange thermal energy, and they will continue to do that, but eventually that exchange will stop. Just gotta wait long enough. If you wait long enough, you'll reach thermal equilibrium and they no longer exchange thermal energy. Just gotta wait long enough, okay? Okay, so thermal equilibrium is when two objects are given the opportunity to exchange thermal energy, but do not. They may have initially, but they no longer do so. When they no longer exchange thermal energy, they are in thermal equilibrium. Okay, now with all those concepts, we are ready to state the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And it often kind of is a little bit of a letdown because it's really just kind of a logical underpinning. But I'm going to state it, talk about it a little bit, um, and then we'll go from there. All right, the zeroth law of thermodynamics is really talking about three, three things. We'll call them for the, in this picture A, B, and T. Object T is a device called a thermoscope. It's a device that we or some engineer working with us has devised that has a, a readout on it that is telling you information about the temperature of the thing. It's doing that because it's built upon the fact that many physical properties of a material depend on its temperature. Resistivity, volume, for example, and you can devise, if you're clever enough, a way to use the change in that property as a measurement of temperature. If you haven't calibrated it yet, it's called a thermoscope. So we've got a thermoscope, and it, it displays a number that is related to the temperature. Okay, that's object T. And then we have object A and object B. So the first picture here on the left shows a thermally insulated box, which is then subdivided therm by thermal insulation into two, pa two parts. In this first picture, we have put object T in contact with object A, and we give them the opportunity to exchange thermal energy. They may initially, but eventually they no longer do, and the readout on the thermoscope settles down and doesn't change anymore. Then object T and object A are in thermal equilibrium. And you can read off and record the number on the thermoscope. Let's say, we don't know the unit because it hasn't been calibrated, but it reads 150. Then object T and object A are in thermal equilibrium and the thermoscope reads out the value 150. Okay, now look at the next picture here in the middle. Same insulated box, but now the thermoscope has been put into contact with object B, separate from A. And we discover, let's say, that what we'd observe is that the thermoscope does not read, it stays at its number and does not change over time at 150. Then object T and object B are in thermal equilibrium. So what we have on the left is object T in thermal equilibrium with object A. What we have in the middle is object T in thermal equilibrium also with object B. 
Now, take away the middle insulating barrier and let A and B come into contact. You will discover they do not exchange thermal energy, i.e. they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So to put all all together, if A and T are in thermal equilibrium, and separately, but at the same time, B and T are in thermal equilibrium, then separately, A and B are in thermal equilibrium. Seem reasonable? Okay. Now, with that in mind, here's the next thing we're going to say. When two objects are in thermal equilibrium, their temperatures are equal. Why? Because object T was a temperature measuring device. And it read 150 in both cases. Okay? When two objects are in thermal equilibrium, their temperatures are equal. Okay? That's another way to define temperature. It's that property of two objects that's the same when they are in thermal equilibrium. And what the zeroth law is saying is that, is that temperature is a well-behaved, measurable property of a system. If A and T have the same temperature, and B and T have that same temperature, then A and B have the same temperature. Now, there's a temptation to say that that is so logically obvious that it really doesn't have any content to it. But let me give you a counterexample. It didn't, doesn't have to be that way in every kind of similar triad of interactions. In other words, let me have three objects, call them A, B, and C, because it doesn't have to be a, th a thermoscope, and let A and C interact, let B and C interact in the same way, will A and B interact in the same way? Not necessarily. Here's an example. Draw it over here on the right. Let's take object, we'll call it object C, to be a horseshoe magnet, or just a magnet, or permanent magnet, a, a piece of um, material that has been permanently magnetized. Let's take object A to be a sample of the element iron, which is normally what's just called a paramagnet, but that hasn't been permanently magnetized. You take that piece of iron and hold it up against a refrigerator door and it'll just fall. Let's take another piece of unmagnetized, another sample of unmagnetized iron, right? Fe is the atomic symbol for iron. Let's call that sample B. All right, now let A and C interact. Sample A will be attracted to the permanent magnet C. There'll be an attraction. Bam. Okay, peel away and put it, peel A away and put it to the side. Now separately, let sample B interact with C, the permanent magnet. Bam. They'll attract, right? B will attract. You'll have to peel it off. Okay, what about A and B? They will not permanently attract. You just put, Okay, so just because A and C interact a certain way and B and C interact that same way doesn't have to mean that A and B interact that same way. But when it comes to temperature, it does. And that's what the zero law of thermodynamics is saying. Okay, all right, now there's one more idea that I want to talk about in this video lecture. This is in section three of chapter 18. It's called, the concept is thermal expansion. In some sense, it's more of an applications idea, if you like, an engineering idea, but it's an important one in mechanical and civil engineering. And the concept is something you're very well acquainted with. Okay, Thermal expansion is referring to the phenomenon of the change in size of an object because of a temperature change. We know from empirical evidence that Materials can change their size if their ambient temperature changes. In almost all situations, when the temperature of something goes up, its size goes up. There's one important counterexample. 
liquid water in a certain narrow temperature range near the freezing point. And that's important, but that's not really the emphasis of this section. In general, if the temperature of something goes up, its size goes up. Conversely, if the temperature goes down, its size goes down. Let's start with something that is shaped like a meter stick or a ruler. Something where one dimension, one of the dimensions, say length, is considerably larger than the other two dimensions. Height and thickness, if you like. And we're going to talk about the concept of what we call linear expansion. So the picture shows, initially, a ruler of some kind. Let's say it's made of steel. Yes, a small hole has been cut out of it, but it's a ruler. And we're going to measure its length, not necessarily with the ruler itself, even though it's marked off, but we're going to take our own meter stick, right, with a least count of millimeters, and we're going to measure the initial length, let's say at room temperature. And we'll call that L0. Okay, then we'll put our meter stick down, and we'll take the steel ruler, and let's put it in a, an oven. And increase the temperature by an amount we, we can decide. We'll call the temperature change delta T. And then carefully take the ruler out of the oven, get back to our meter stick, which did not go in the oven, and measure the length. It will be longer, yes? The picture here, although it's highly exaggerated, shows the expanded ruler after it has come out of the oven. That's the lower picture. And they're showing you that in this case, since the ruler is free at either end, it expands equally at either end to get the new longer length. We want a formula for calculating how much the length has changed. In this case, increased. Total. I'll call that change delta L. Okay. Well, there's, it's empirical. You can do lots of measurements. And you will find that the, the length change of the ruler depends on three things. The material it's made of, so it's a material property, how long it was to begin with, L initial, and how much its temperature changed, delta T. All right, let's talk about that a little bit more. First of all, here's an interesting question for you. Why does linear expansion happen as the temperature goes up? Why physically? Does the length of the ruler increase when the temperature increases? You might want to pause the video and think about that. But what would you tell somebody, even somebody who was perhaps a little bit skeptical? What's the physical cause of linear expansion? Okay, so ultimately the cause of linear expansion is the atomic fact of matter, right? It's made of atoms. And this is really not disputed. Okay? This has been now, I mean, it was initially way back in the early 1900s, but not anymore. Experiment has told us definitively, yes, the atomic fact, there, is, there are atoms in matter. They're spaced out in this ruler. And the simple fact is that with an increase in temperature, the spacing between the atoms increases. Each one has more space between its neighbors. And so, if you had a chain of atoms with a certain spacing, and the temperature went up, and they all had more spacing, that's going to make the line longer. And that's why it also depends on L initial. How many atoms are there in the chain to begin with? Because the more there are, when each one requires more room, you're going to get more increase. Okay, so the delta L depends on how long it is to begin with, it depends on how much the temperature changed, delta T. And then it also depends on the nature of the atoms themselves. Is it steel? Or is it aluminum? Or is it copper? What is it made of? Or wood? Some kind of wood, right? It depends on what it's made of. So the formula for delta L then depends on the initial length, the L initial, the temperature change, delta T, and then there's a constant that is a property 
of the material that is roughly temperature independent. This constant has a symbol, when you talk about linear expansion, that's a Greek lowercase alpha, and its name is the coefficient of linear expansion. It's material dependent. You can look it up in a table. You say, hey, I'm dealing with steel. Then look up the coefficient of linear expansion for steel. Now I want to think a minute about the unit of this quantity, alpha. Let's think in the SI system. L initial length would be in meter, just to label the unit. Temperature change can be expressed either in Kelvin or Celsius degree, because it's temperature change. Delta L, change in length, has to be in meters. So what must be the SI unit of alpha, the coefficient of linear expansion, in order for the two sides to have the same units? Alpha has to have a unit of 1 over Kelvin, or 1 over Celsius degree. You can use the other one. Okay. So the SI unit is 1 over Kelvin, but it will also be expressed as 1 over Celsius degree, and it depends on the material. As I said, L0 is the initial length of the object before the temperature change, and delta T is the temperature change. SI unit is Kelvin, but it could also be expressed as Celsius degrees. Note, by the way, in the two pictures of the ruler, before the expansion and afterwards, what happened to the hole that we had cut in it? Can you tell from the picture? They're trying to, they're trying to show you, say, the diameter of the hole. What happened to the diameter of the hole in the steel ruler as a result of the temperature increase when we put it in the oven? The diameter of the hole got bigger. Can you see that? That's an important point, because a lot of people want to think that if you have a hole in something, like this ruler, and you increase the temperature of it, the expansion will be such to start to fill in the hole and make the hole smaller. It's not the way it works, it turns out. This is empirical. All dimensions of the material get larger, including the dimensions of any cavities or holes. In fact, that hole will increase in size exactly the same as if it had been filled in with the steel. You can test it empirically. You can take the original ruler. You can cut out the little circular hole and have that little, then that little circular disc of steel. You can put both the ruler with the hole and the steel disc in the oven and let them undergo the same temperature change, delta T. Then the disc will have to expand because it's made of steel and then take them out of the oven and take that steel disc and put it into where the hole was in the ruler and it will just fit. Okay, okay so watch out. Cavities, holes in the material, increase with the expansion just as if it were filled in. Okay, one more thing. and I'll show you that in a demonstration in class too so that you can see it in action. One more thing. I was talking about linear expansion for something like a ruler or a stick or a rod. There we tend to be talking about something has, that has one of its dimensions, length, that's quite a bit larger than the other two, height and thickness. But don't be deceived. All the dimensions of the object expand if the temperature goes up. All of them, length, height, and thickness. So you can ask about and talk about volume expansion of a material. And of course, if you're talking about a liquid or a gas, volume expansion is really the only one that matters. And here's the empirical formula to talk about the volume expansion of an object. How much will its volume change, delta V, if there's a temperature change, delta T? Well, it's really just an empirical version of the linear expansion one. Instead of the initial length, start with the initial volume of the thing. 
what was its actual volume before the temperature change. And then multiply by a constant that is material dependent. The symbol now, right here, watch out, that's not a B. That's a Greek lowercase beta. And it's called the coefficient of volume expansion. And it turns out, and you can show this mathematically, I'm just going to state it for you, that the coefficient of volume expansion for any material, like steel, is three times the coefficient of linear expansion for the same material. Coefficient of volume expansion beta is just three times the coefficient of linear expansion. Beta is three alpha, not alpha cubed, but three times alpha. V initial is the initial volume, and of course, delta T is the temperature change. Okay, so I'm going to bring this video to a close, and what we're going to do in our class session together, our first one, is um, talk about thermal expansion and do a Wiley plus type example problem that involves thermal expansion. But that's all for this video.